Shall we start? Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the virtual book talk to discuss Egypt's housing crisis, the shaping of urban space by Yahya Shalkat, published by AUC Press in 2020. I'm Susan Inewi, marketing manager for AUC Press and Bookstores. And tonight's talk should take around one hour and we're gonna have as usual a room for Q and A. So feel free to type in your questions in the Q and A box you find at the bottom of your screen. Um, I would like to first uh, thank Yahya and Ursula for joining us tonight. And I want to give you a brief about their biographies. Um, Yahya Shalkat is an advocate and researcher of affordable housing. He's the co-founder and research director of Ten Tuba. I hope I'm saying it that uh, correctly. It's a Cairo-based research studio where he has developed social housing programs, policies, and strategies. Yahya edits his housing and spatial justice-focused built environment observatory. And he has authored a number of works, including tonight's uh, book, Egypt's Housing Crisis, and he co-edited Nashtari uh, Kulla Shay, We Buy Everything by Darin Maraya, published in 2022. Our moderator for tonight, Ursula Nsi, is a reporter, an essayist, and a book reviewer who has lived and worked in North Africa and the Middle East since 2002. She has a long-standing interest in the built environment and urban development of Cairo. She has lived in Egypt and Morocco and reported for Newsweek, the New York Times, and the Chronicle of Higher Education. And today she lives in Amman, Jordan. And she writes for the New York Review of Books and co-hosts a podcast on Arabic literature and translation titled Bulek or Bulak. So welcome and thank you Yahya and Ursula and thank you everyone for joining. Uh, uh, just a quick reminder that this event is also broadcasted live on Facebook. So if you're watching on Facebook and you want to ask questions, please do send them in the comment and we're gonna ask them here. And now I'm gonna leave the floor to Ursula. Thank you. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here this evening to talk about uh, this book, which I think is um, going to be uh, an incredible resource and a reference for everyone who's interested uh, in the city of Cairo and in the issue of housing. And um, before I, I turn the floor over to Yahya, I'll just talk a little bit uh, about the book uh, for those who haven't had a chance to read it yet. Um, it is, uh, like I said, I think a, a precious resource um, and it incorporates, um, I think, a lot of field work and a lot of personal observation and also a lot of data that's been sort of painstakingly put together from official sources in a way that gives um, a clear picture of some of the trends that we've seen uh, over the 20th century uh, in, the, in the built housing environment. Um, and it addresses what has been seemingly a crisis or a problem in housing that has existed since the beginning of the Egyptian state and actually before uh, under colonialism. Um, it's, uh, I mean, as we all know, Cairo in particular has come under huge demographic pressure, enormous increase in its population throughout its entire modern history. So there's always been this question of, of housing all these people uh, who are coming to the city. Uh, and I love that at the beginning of the book, uh, Yahya, you talk a bit about the way Egyptian movies have actually portrayed this. and. Uh, how, how many stories there are in them about people desperately seeking housing and the uh, tragic and comic situations that they, they end up finding themselves in as they try to find a place to live in the city. What's really staggering is, is to see this, this huge problem sort of laid out. Um, and it's, uh, it's huge and it's very complex. And so the book tries to unpack a whole series of factors that are at play here um, from legal issues like rent control uh, and economic issues like speculation and political issues, the various agendas that have been put forth by different uh, governments with different orientations um, 
And then what, what people have actually done for themselves, uh, because most of the housing in, in Cairo and in Egypt has actually been self-built housing. Um, and, but what one sees and what you, you lay out is that, is that despite an enormous amount of construction of, including construction of housing, there's, there's a lot of, of housing that remains vacant and at the same time that remains inaccessible, unaffordable. Uh, that it's very difficult for people uh, to, to buy a house or to find affordable rents. Um, and also this issue that people who have homes don't necessarily have full legal title to their, to their house. And you get into why that's the case and the ramifications of this kind of housing insecurity um, uh, that, uh, that, that can lead to people losing their homes, in fact, and to whole neighborhoods, in fact, being moved. Um, so, so the book looks at different facets of this and, uh, and gives the historical development. Um, we see some very dramatic changes, like, you know, the way, for example, the, really, the housing market has moved from being a very rent-dominated one to being one where buying a house is, is what is encouraged and what people are aiming for and the reasons why that happens. Um, you have a chapter about agricultural uh, housing in, in, in rural communities and the move from a almost a feudal housing system on great agrarian properties, the ISBA, through uh, the 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 development of, of of farmers you know having and building their own house and then and then back almost to uh, to workers once again being uh, being housed on and sort of on giant farms and 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 I think that's that's a very interesting one and the one that I didn't know anything about one discovers a lot of things in this book even if you've been interested in the city for a long time and in urban development issues, there are things that uh, there, there's a lot of discoveries to be made and, and, and things that I, for example, did not know. Um, and at the same time that you trace these really big changes, I think certain themes recur. Um, and um, one of them is this huge demand for a house that's always been there, this huge difficulty uh, in, in accessing it. The other is informality uh, and, the, and the huge challenge that that presents. And you talk about manufactured informality, informality almost as a, as a choice or, an, you know, uh, and I think that's something to, to get into is that what, what does it do and how intentional is it that so many people live in a sort of gray zone when it comes to their, to their homes um, and why that's the case and what could be done to change that. Um, and, and also I think there's a theme of um, where when one, one sees a lot of construction of housing done as a kind of social engineering, whether it's the model villages or workers housing, you see a lot of housing being built to sort of like construct a particular kind of Egyptian farmer or worker or citizen. And it often doesn't work. Um, it's it's the, the sort of official plan is often at odds with what people actually need and want and are already doing for themselves. And that disconnect, I think, is, is, is also a, an ongoing issue that, that one sees. So um, I'm not gonna say anything more about this. We'll, we'll get into these, these issues in more detail. The book is beautifully illustrated by a lot of photos that you took yourself. And so I think what we're going to do is, is, is go through some of these images and, and talk uh, through the images about uh, some of these issues regarding housing. Great, well, thanks um, for organizing this and, um, and for inviting me. Um, and I mean, it's a beautiful introduction to the book. Uh, that I've been told is very depressing. So it's <laughs> a so double kudos there. Let me, um, yeah, I guess I'll start by sharing some of the, the pictures in the book and maybe each one I'll talk about a bit and, uh, and it would lead us into one of the main topics. Maybe that's, uh, that may be easier for the audience.
Yeah, where better to start than the cover? Um, and this is uh, this is the original picture for the cover. Um, I took uh, maybe uh, twelve years ago, before uh, about a year or so before the revolution. I took my bicycle onto the ring road uh, on a Friday morning, and I was cycling um, with this big sort of project in my head that I'll take uh, pictures of the whole elevation uh, of the ring road. I just did maybe. I don't know about half an hour of cycling, so so not that long, um, and I never got back to that project. But I think this picture, um, later on looking at it, says a lot about how the housing market has, um, or, or housing itself has developed in Egypt. So from uh, basically owner built outside of market uh, housing that you see uh, on the bottom left, this small maybe three-story uh, building, uh, probably built by a family as it's a family housing and grew uh, vertically as uh, uh, sons or daughters got married. Um, and then just completely dwarfed uh, by this kind of informal investor-built um, housing in the back. And I think those are actually two buildings back to back um, and that don't have any windows because they're overlooking uh, private property next to them, so their their facades are on um, on the other sides that you don't see, and it's just this kind of eating up uh, <clears throat> both the visual sphere, but also agricultural land, and and this is really the paradox that we've had is that housing has become so valuable, um, and the real estate market has become so deregulated that making a profit from uh, this sort of construction, even if it, if it looks, um, if it doesn't look that appealing, um, has become far stronger than uh, providing food uh, through the land, which actually economically uh, has been very uh, bad for uh, owners and farmers. And now this this housing, though, first of all, it's. Uh, it's more economically efficient to build, right, than sort of legal housing. Like it's cost efficient for the people who are doing it, let's say for the family. And then it's a good investment for the people who are building the huge block behind it, right? I, I, yes and no. I mean, and on one side, it, it is in a way. And even when the, it costs about maybe 20% less to build, yourself than to get a contractor and then there's another big saving that you do when you when you build your own house and not uh, buy it from a developer so so uh, yeah doing the, the the sort of the raw product is uh, cuts out the middleman as they say but at the other end you also have a lot of bribes to pay there is um, a long-term instability uh, of your housing if it's not legalized later on. So there were different waves of legalization that have started probably from the 1950s um, all the way up to the last uh, uh, reconciliation law that was passed in 2017 and, and people um, over a million uh, applications uh, were put forward by the end of uh, uh, 2020 when the door closed uh, on that sort of batch of legalization. So, so it's always been this kind of running to sort of access um, this housing. But at the same time, you can argue that um, if, if other areas were well planned, but accessible to, let's say, the average uh, Egyptian, it would have been the same cost. But then if you go to the desert sort of suburbs or so-called new cities around Cairo, um, someone who built that uh, owner-built house uh, would not be able to get land, whether uh, affordably, whether um, that is in, in this kind of rules and regulations that uh, appeal to this kind of incremental housing. Because in, in this instance, I mean, most people that, that have built this way um, it's a way of saving or, or sort of future proof proofing your income and your savings. So um, in one year, you probably have enough money or a couple of years 
to, to buy the small plot of land that you build on. And then the next you start digging and, and putting in the foundations. And then the next you probably build complete the first floor and so on. So so you build as uh, as money comes in, because if you save it in a bank, it loses value. There's no other. So this is kind of the way it happens from one end uh, to the other. But in new cities, you can't do that. Um, the last uh, so-called affordable uh, plots, you had to build four stories in, in five years. Um, and the plots were a bit big uh, for what let's say, uh, an average family would want. So it went really against this kind of, uh, let's say, organic way that that uh, most people have operated on uh, for, for decades. Right. And you discuss in the book also the way in which this kind of organic way of building is both frowned upon and yet tolerated. And ultimately, mm -hmm. the authorities know that it's needed because there's no other provider of housing. I mean, it is the single largest amount of housing is built this way, right? In the city. Yes, exactly. It's about maybe 70%, 75% over the last three or four decades. So officially it's condemned and it's sort of outside of the bounds of the law and of infrastructure, but then actually there's this long process of negotiating and hoping to actually get it recognized on the part of the people who build it. And that often does work. And you mentioned amnesties and regularizations and so on. So there's this kind of pro very complicated process really of, of the regulations being so strict and then being circumvented and then kind of negotiating your way into semi-legality afterwards. Yes, I mean, it's a, it, it needs people that, that understand how how the system works. You you go through that. It's a sort of a, a baptism by fire. You you try it out, you build, you get your uh, uh, your first building or whatever demolished. You build again. Uh, you try and see. So it's it's this kind of practice. And um, and here is the inefficiency: is that it's an inefficiency of building material, of energy, of uh, of everything involved, of course, effort. Um, and so on. And then at, at the end of the day, there, there is, the, 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 what really gets to me is that there are solutions and there have been, but they haven't been applied, they haven't been uh, consolidated um, in the way that they could have. And this brings uh, to the fore the politics of this. So, so housing has not been independent of, of, uh, of politics, and this is what's making it uh, a crisis. Mm. I am so, speaking of housing policy. Yeah, this is, um, these are, for example, houses that were built in the 1940s. This is one of the earliest uh, worker colonies. And uh, while there were probably by the end of the 30s, uh, a few private businesses building uh, colonies, because what you had at the time that was Egypt's main industrial revolution, um, in the, just in the in the beginning, the, the quarter of uh, of the 20th century, so much later than than Europe than, than in Europe, and then you had this kind of rural uh, urban migration, and not necessarily to the capital Cairo, which has had a lot of uh, spotlight on it, but this, for example, is in Mahala which used to be a small uh, provincial town and then grew until today is the biggest uh, city in the Delta. Uh, and you read that like in Hanan Hamad's book uh, on, uh, on workers, uh, how uh, this boom town had immense housing shortages uh, in the 1930s with people living, uh, sleeping in three uh, sort of consecutive uh, time slots in one room uh, because that's the, that worked with the shifts of the, the the working shifts and this is what they could afford is sharing with these three other groups of people someone called it the sort of the warm beds so the beds would never uh, become cold because someone's always sleeping um, so they started building uh, some uh, some colonies to house the workers and and, and this was a big push uh, towards kind of a welfare uh, type of housing. Um, but today, like after 
many years of different kind of regimes. We went through socialism and these industries were nationalized along with this housing. And then through the 90s, the economy was again liberalized and then these companies were being privatized. And a very big part of their privatization was um, managing these assets that they had. And the biggest assets was real estate. So housing like this that started off being welfare was standing in the way of potential profits um, off of these companies. And for the longest time, they've been trying to evict uh, people that have lived there. Um, and while normally uh, people that would reach pension age would be able to find social housing through these agreements and social uh, responsibility deals that, that go back uh, decades. Um, after these liberalization policies, they couldn't. So where would they go uh, with small pensions and uh, very heated housing markets? So, so this is another example of these kind of um, policies not continuing. They start somewhere, uh, they work for a while, but then they meet this kind of dead end. Yeah, and you talk about the, the the Nasser regime obviously was perhaps the one that was the most seriously interested and committed to providing affordable housing. And they had plans where employers should provide it to their workers. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you mentioned that Nasser wrote out in his journal a like, detailed plan with all the different housing initiatives that he wanted to see implemented. Um, at the, the private sector was also part of that, but they thought the state would have a significant role to play. And then I think you lay out that in, then that there was a real reversal of that in the sense that even as the state continued to build public housing, the it it became it would build public housing but for people who could afford to buy it at even if subsidized still quite expensive rates and so it was not really accessible to a lot of people and there were also a lot of conditions you had to have a formal employment you had to some cases not have a police record right so so it's it even a lot of hoops to jump limited well, yeah, I mean, this is this is the main thing is that the, the kind of social housing, let's say, policy um, did not really start in Egypt until the mid 1950s. So before that, you had some workers colonies, some housing for um, employees of, of, of certain government owned infrastructure who needed to live um, away or, or in remote areas, uh, but where social housing um, in other countries started in the late 19th century or, or after World War I. Um, in Egypt, it really started taking off in the 1950s. Um, and even then it was all, it's a lot of this kind of hit and miss. So it started out being for rent, which is how most uh, social housing policies are. But then by the 1970s, um, in 1977, Sadat passed a law where housing would be owned. So whether older uh, housing uh, tenants can apply to sort of uh, buy their housing, um, <clears throat> which is similar to Thatcher's right to buy scheme that was uh, implemented in the UK in 1980s. Um, but then also any new social housing being built by the government would be sold. And this is basically the paradigm that we're still in today. And in many ways, this goes against the whole idea and concept of social housing is that once it is sold or once it becomes uh, an asset, it becomes a commodity and it can become part of the market. And there we see this sort of rules and regulations around who can own it, who can apply, um, which income segments, what they can do with it, and so on. And it turns into what you were talking about with informal housing, is that people are always running and struggling to um, legalize what they have in the same way this has opened the opportunity for abuse, and then also the opportunity to either uh, legalize uh, this abuse with bribes and with other sort of under the table uh, agreements and so on. So it's it's it really makes it um, almost impossible to regulate because what is the difference? How can you regulate 
or super regulate uh, private property that becomes really part of the market um, and at the same time try and, and push it as a, as a social scheme. So it, it, it really doesn't work. And, and the, um, up until the current uh, social housing project we have today, you have to see the infrastructure they have tried to put and manage um, to control uh, this housing being for um, this band of people and beneficiaries um, that are supposed to, to be uh, the deserving um, the strata of society of this kind of welfare housing, and it's it's a it's a very very big uh, endeavor. So what I feel is that well, you do away with this kind of selling it uh, as social housing, and you go back to renting it. And th th there's a lot of ways that you can sort of subsidize it, because basically what you have is that wages have never been high enough for people to afford. Um, properly built housing, and this is what Mahmoud Riyad, who was Egypt's first official uh, um, of housing, uh, said way back in the 1930s in a paper that he wrote. So, and this still stands today. However much you try and subsidize or bring uh, prices down, the main problem is access to this housing. Is that wages aren't uh, aren't big enough, or income isn't big enough to afford this housing. And can you tell us this, what are we looking at here, this building that's... This is from, um, this is actually called Mubarak's housing. So this is one of uh, two or three projects that bore his name. That, and this was the biggest one at the time with a um, electoral aim to build half a million uh, housing units in his uh, five years of uh, elected presidency. So this, this was part of his campaign in 2005. And this was probably built by the end of 2000s. And here I visited it in 2012. And as you can see, not much of it is, has, has been lived in. It's, it's about two or three apartments um, uh, that have been lived in and the rest are still empty and closed. And this is something else that was symptomatic of this kind of housing is that um, it's built in remote areas. This was at the outskirts of uh, 6th October city, literally in the desert. Um, the people I talked with there uh, had come. I went on a Friday, so so a few people were there because this is when they go and check up on their apartment and so on. But they hadn't moved in uh, permanently uh, because there weren't schools. Uh, they needed to have a car and and so on. So it's it's um, so even if it is let's say on paper affordable, there's still a lot of. Um, hurdles that one must pass to be able to to really enjoy uh, this housing if it's better than whatever housing they have before. Mm. So is this in one of the new cities? Yes, exactly. So I, 6th of October is a new city that was one of the earliest to, to be built to the west of Cairo. So maybe I'll take this chance. We we have a few questions trickling trickling in already, and someone was asking, "What is the effect of new cities on the housing market? Like, how much has has that had an impact? This is something that the government has pursued significantly: the establishment of new cities." I mean, new cities as a concept is is is, is a bit misleading because. I mean, Cairo has always grown, and since Heliopolis, it's been growing into the desert. So when Heliopolis was built in the in, in 1906 or seven, um, it was considered a desert oasis that was actually a suburb outside of Cairo. Now it's pretty much um, within the, the the main body of Cairo that we know today. So so th this kind of expansion, um, these aren't really cities; they're new neighborhoods that are, are added. Uh, the Cairo as it sort of expands to the east and to the west. And um, when when this kind of concept started in, in this naming the new cities in the, in the late 1970s, the idea first was to sort of build um, housing uh, for the working class, move them out of the city, put all the industry and whatever and sort of rejuvenate um, the, the, the center of Cairo. And this sort of stood, but a lot of people didn't end up moving because of, of what we just mentioned. And it was only in the 1990s that you started having some 
meaningful population. And it was all by disaster again, because you had the earthquake in 92, and over 10,000 buildings collapsed. And the only housing that was empty was in these new cities that the government had built over the, the years prior. So a lot of people were forced to move there and to start um, building these communities. But then by the end of the 90s, the government started finding out, well, it's a good way for the middle class to build their own homes um, and, uh, and have these sort of owner built uh, villas and, uh, and uh, low rise buildings like you did uh, in the 1950s and 60s in Mohandesin and in, in Heliopolis. So they started dishing out uh, plots to people close to the government, uh, high level employees mm -hmm. and people that could afford it. And at the time it was relatively affordable to, to buy a plot. But then it quickly by the 2000s, they found out that, well, this is actually better for luxury housing because we can build gated communities and they can have big plots of land and you can get in big investors and so on. So, so these shifts that have happened and you see them in, in the sort of the older new cities is that they have downtowns or, or, or uh, these core neighborhoods that are all working class and then around them like a ring of this kind of middle class uh, homes that are on the street and then you have these gated compounds and just miles of uh, of walled-in housing um, that's that's for the rich, um, and now they have characters. So this city, for example, that we see here in this picture, has been renamed uh, October Gardens, and it's mostly almost exclusively social housing estates. Um, whereas uh, a few kilometers to the northeast of it, you have Sheikh Zayed, which is now almost exclusively uh, gated communities. So, so th this kind of shift, yeah, it has, uh, Cairo did need to expand in a way, and the, the middle of it and the old part of it is dense, but then these new communities have expanded also pretty much in terms of area, but they remain very, um, low density and and unpopulated uh, because of this kind of speculative market. Hmm. So I'll, I'll pose one other question from the audience just because this is also connected. So on this issue of speculation, someone asked, why is it that so much housing stock sits empty? Well, it, I, it, it's a mix of different things. Um, one thing that we see by the late 70s is that a lot of Egyptians start traveling abroad to the Gulf and making a living there. But then when you're there, you can't, you, there's no citizenship. You, you need to come back uh, to Egypt after you've uh, you finished your contract, if you're fired, if you're uh, pensioned off and so on. So a lot of the money makes its way back. And uh, because the pound has been devalued, um, goes through these big cycles of devaluation every few years, um, having cash or putting money in the bank isn't, uh, isn't gonna, going to do anything to your savings. So in, in a very big way, housing became uh, the only asset that Egyptians could buy or build to maintain the value um, of, of their hard earned uh, cash that they, they earned in years of working abroad. Um, so, so it became a sort of a future proofing of uh, your kids and building for the future, but also then also building maybe more or having more housing than, uh, than you need and becoming then a kind of landlord. Um, but also because you had uh, the rent control uh, laws that were in place until 96, a lot of people didn't want to rent the housing out because that would mean it would be locked into uh, these almost perpetual uh, rental agreements at very low values, so they wouldn't. And this has, this we see how the rent controls were circumvented um, from the 70s on. So I think these two things, this kind of economy that is outside of Egypt, so this sort of regional economy, remittances coming in and needing to go somewhere, the lack of uh, investment opportunity that is open to uh, these working class and middle class Egyptians that made this money led to uh, that this type of housing market. So 
you've been building and you've had the surplus uh, of housing. I mean, today it stands at an almost unbelievable 12 million units. Um, I think maybe about three quarters of them, or let's say half of them are livable. So they're finished, they have infrastructure and so on. If you look at that number, um, it really means on a quantifiable level that we don't need to build any housing for probably the next decade. Uh, because it would take up any new families that uh, that would need housing. But then again, it's not open on the market because uh, people don't believe in the, in the rental laws and in their, uh, that their rights would be protected if, uh, if homes are rented out. And if they are, they're rented out at, at very high prices that make it unaffordable for a lot of people. So again, it's this kind of cycle of distrust and so on. So you just, it's, 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 it's like a stock market. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. Um, well, shall we shall we look at the next image and so here we move to, to another tool. So so in addition to my photography and my interest in photography, the, the Google Earth has uh, became um, um, a very valuable tool to a lot of urbanists and people trying to understand what's going on. Um, and one of the things that caught my eye was how um, in some rural areas, you actually found these very gridded, very planned looking settlements. Um, and reading through uh, Timothy Mitchell's book, Rule of Experts, he has a chapter on this rise of the hamlets built by the the feudalists of the 19th century. And you find that in, it's an estimated that a big portion of uh, rural uh, inhabitants lived in these um, housing through whether coercion or control or, um, and so on. So what we've learned um, at architecture school about villages being sort of the organic kind of uh, spontaneous um, building of uh, farmers and peasants, there's actually a very big part of it that was planned and that urban planning um, in the modern sense started there. Um, this one is, uh, is the Isba of, um, that's featured in Mona Abaza's book, the Cotton Plantations. And on the left, you see this is the hamlet of about 90 houses. Um, that were built for the Falahin. And here at the bottom right is the mansion with its garden. And then in the back, this is the utility area. And, and this is a relatively recent image from the 2000s. Of course, later on, this has changed. You see a lot of land here, uh, more land being built on and so on. Um, but this is what's interesting for me is that you have this genesis of housing that is provided, but not necessarily in a benevolent way um to the workers and then this moves on and you see this kind of jump to urban housing or social housing or workers housing from this rural setting to the urban setting um, so in one way you see this kind of architectural or planning uh continuum uh, through these images and, and also through policy and laws that regulated how ISBES should be built and, and what kind of minimum standards they should have and so on, to laws on, uh, on urban housing and, and the building law and urban planning. Although the, the ESBA is, is, is one of the only, the circumstances in which housing is provided is when it's actually economically beneficial to the, the so in this case, it's, it's actually benefits of way to have a controlled workforce. And one of the ways in which you have leverage over the workforce, as you explained, is that they don't own that housing. So mm -hmm. they, they live there, they need to live there to have access to their livelihood, but you actually own the housing. And, and in later cases, this has again turned into a, a legal question of housing security because people have have never really gotten title to these homes, even though they've lived there for generations, right? Well, um, when when again rent laws that that governed uh, agricultural land were liberalized in the nineteen nineties, um, there was huge evictions of of hundreds of thousands of uh, farmers from their land, and many of them were living in. In, in these sorts of hamlets 
um, and a lot of them had to, were evicted and were landless and homeless. Um, whether, but in some other cases, some were able to negotiate, like in, in uh, Mona Abbas's farm, um, we're told how people were able to buy um, the land from uh, the, the big land owning family and probably their houses. There's other cases where people are there in this kind of uh, agreed amnesty. So they don't have legal papers, but at the same time, the owners um, aren't moving to evict them. So this, again, this kind of gray area um, where housing is. And, and this is really symptomatic is that um, when, when you look at this, the, uh, the, the housing situation or you're looking at title and tenure and ownership, there's a lot of gray that has to be um, dealt with. And it's the kind of the, the, the adding up, it's been adding up over uh, decades of changing laws and changing regimes and, um, and approaches uh, to housing that in a while you're going to find that most people are living in some sort of gray area where they don't exactly know uh, what they have, but it's just sort of customary um, ownership rather than um, clear or outright tenure. Right, and the effect of that, of course, is, I mean, it's quite extraordinary to have such a large percentage of the people not, you know, really not owning or not having the security and what is a basic it's a human right housing I mean it's 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 a it's a basic need and then um it creates uh all it creates a need to circumvent the law practically like you can't proceed without it and so there's sort of small daily circumventions on the part of people who are just trying to keep their home, and then there are large circumvention. I think this is what your next picture speaks to, is, is some of the, the real ways in which the law can be bent, right? And the regulation can be bent. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is really what I feel was the, the, the peak of, of, uh, of the crisis uh, in a way. This picture is from 2018 in, in Giza, again, from the, from the ring road. And what you see, this is the, um, there was a very big um, drive to demolish uh, informal buildings. And for decades, uh, authorities have always said, well, we can't demolish a building because it, people have already lived in there. Uh, a lot of courts have ruled that they have a right to, to keep the homes um, in, in previous cases, so they couldn't uh, do demolitions once uh, people occupy them and live in them. Um, and of course, here you see again this kind of these informal developers. So, so this is really housing that's that's built for profit and not uh, not for direct need of whoever built it. Um, but you see here this kind of selective uh, demolition. So most of the building has been demolished. What you see is a skeleton. But then you see two or three apartments that are left because they probably had people living in them. But then in the end, this this building is is, is as good as, as demolished because how, how do you live there? How do you um, how do you feel safe um, in a building looking like that? Um, so so this is this is rare, um, but 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 it happened at a big scale. Um, in 2018, and this was in a way seen as a way to sort of push people to legalize um, the buildings that they had because um, the legalization law also meant that you pay the fine. And the fine was seen as, as a heavy fine. It, it was it cost a certain percentage of, uh, um, of what the building was or, or your home was valued at. So, so a lot of people in the, were thought that they wouldn't and in the beginning, people really didn't apply. And by the end of it, um, about a million applications were put in. Um, no one knows exactly if this million is a big number or a small number, because we don't know, again, exactly how many uh, informal homes there are. Um, but a million is still a million, and each one paid an average of six or seven thousand pounds. Some have paid a lot more, uh, depending on where they are. So, so it was a good revenue. Um, stream for the government to sort of collect money from um, from people to legalize their buildings. Hmm. 
And, and then of course, though, because the process is somewhat opaque of the legalization or the or the or the amnesties, it le it leaves a, a quite arbitrary spectrum of, you know, basically when these infractions are forgiven and and when they're not, and they take place on a really big scale too, with like massive luxury developments. I mean, yes. just and, yeah, and, and and it's good that you pointed out that way because it's more of an informalization, so it's a conscious act of of this manufacturing informality and not a kind of a passive thing that, oh, we weren't there and, and we couldn't take care of it and now we're trying to sort of shore it up. But I think it's it's been already set up for it to happen um, and that it, it creates the, these opportunities for uh, people at different levels of, uh, of government, local government and, and so on to, uh, to make money and at the same time keep owners sort of not sure and uh, and you're able to sort of pounce on them uh, whenever you wish uh, to extract some some revenue from but at the same time it opens the door for let's say big connected developers um, to also abuse this uh, informality uh, and make money in a way where they're not running uh, from this kind of policy um, so you see in Izbet al Hagena, a very well-known self-built area in, uh, to the east of Cairo, it started out being sold by um, people close to the Sadat family at the time, and this was government land, uh, there was no proper ownership for this company or group of people, um, and in the end people were considered squatters who had bought there, but the settlement has been developed into a very large um, community that it could not be uh, demolished and people could not be evicted at that scale. So then you have, again, layers of sort of uh, getting electricity and getting uh, infrastructure in, and these all presented opportunities for people trying to run as parliamentarians. There is that these promises would buy them votes. So. So you had a lot of these cycles uh, from the 80s throughout the 2000s. Hmm. Um, I'm going to ask you a couple more questions uh, from the from the audience, and these both have to do a little bit with like looking forward. Um, one is uh, whether in looking at actual solutions, whether the private sector can can play a part in the affordable housing market in Egypt and how? And the other question, I'll give them both to you and you see how you want to, is about the future of downtown, uh, downtown Cairo with, um, you know, this issue of the, the Mugama being, being moved and the ministries being moved and, and what might be expected to happen down there, especially since it's a area I think where old rents are still in place, but gentrification is happening. I think for the first question is which private sector? I mean, the big um, the big developers and, and we, we all know their names, the um, older building is, is luxury developments. And if you read the, the pamphlets, uh, whether of these developments or, or of the companies, you see that of course the bottom line is profit. So. And it, I mean, different from uh, many countries who somehow uh, find a way to recoup or, or put uh, the private sector within um, a cycle of, of giving back or uh, being or, or having a certain percentage of their uh, whatever they build to be sold affordably or to be given to uh, the social housing sector and so on. Um, Egypt doesn't have any of this. It's a completely deregulated market that leaves, that actually encourages um, house prices to keep going up. Um, Egypt now is also, as a government, um, is very much part of this market. So through the new urban communities authority, NUCA, um, it's become the largest developer building about a quarter of a million uh, housing units a year. So, and a lot of them are for-profit units. So it's not just social housing, it's building, it's building on, on a very big uh, range uh, of pricing. So why would it create policy that would um, rob it of, uh, of revenue? So, so this is really a very big uh, issue that needs to be seen. Um, is that the market 
needs to be regulated. There, there has to be um, uh, caps put in place, not necessarily direct price caps. Uh, Egypt isn't going to, to be a sort of the state um, anytime soon, but there are many um, market and, and liberal uh, countries that still have um, regulations in place to, to keep this market from ballooning and just getting out of hand. Mm. Um, in terms of downtown, I'm sorry, can you repeat? Maybe yeah, the question was a bit about what you expect to be the trajectory of that neighborhood since, you know, the giant administrative building that Mugama is moving mm. out and so are a lot of other government buildings. And the I, I'm not sure if this is correct, but I think quite a few of the buildings there are maybe still under old rent more, mm. more than other parts of Cairo. And at the same time, there is a sort of gentrification taking place. So what do you expect to be sort of the future of that part of the city? I mean, it's very hard to tell because I mean, right now there's, there's the, the market itself uh, and, and the, in terms of, let's say square meters being built and a number of units being built in many different places, um, whether inside the old capital. So you have the Nespiro Triangle, you have uh, a few plots on the Corniche, you have all this land that the government is going to vacate. Uh, in Munira and around downtown. Um, and you have other developments in Sur Magralayun near the aqueduct. So, so there's a lot of, of real estate that potentially is happening or, or, or is going on there. But you also have a lot of, of square meterage being built in the new capital and then in other cities around, uh, around Egypt. I, I can't tell, I mean, um, if, if the economy still holds, I don't know whether this can all be sort of populated by money. Is there enough money to go around um, as buy? Are there enough buyers uh, for this real estate and especially for potential real estate in downtown? That's it's going to take years to sort of um, transfigure. So it's it's pretty hard to tell. I mean, it can if it happens slowly, you will see change in the next 10, 20 years. Um, if it happens too quickly, um, a lot of it might happen like what happened in Beirut and it would be like another sort of ghost core where um, the, the real estate is, is bought uh, for invest in investing or speculative purposes, but no one uh, moves in. Or um, even worse, uh, a crash is that the real estate is not sold and these companies go bust. Um, and again, they're stopped sort of midway uh, in their construction until some years later they're picked up. I mean, you, um, anyone who's lived in Cairo from the 80s saw those two big black towers, the Cairo Plaza uh, in Bolet. Uh, they were empty for two decades um, until the bank uh, actually repossessed them and populated one of them and the others stood empty again for another number of years. So, um, so you also have that risk. So I don't know. I mean, I can't. There aren't good numbers or, or or any numbers to really go about. But I mean, you have these kind of three scenarios that uh, that might play out. Mm. I I have a uh, a question. We're nearing the end, and I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, potentials helpful steps that could be taken. As you say, it is it is a dire picture. It, it, it is. Um, but you you mentioned, you know, that it would be good to take some measures to sort of um, cool the housing market or avoid like this endless spiral of speculation. I'm wondering if there are like other countries that have faced similar issues and have, a, if there's like some models or some examples or things that you think would be particularly useful to do that could be helpful? I think it's, it's a little hard to talk about models because also where we're starting from is very different than, than where other countries are mm -hmm. at. But I mean, for, for each of these different, let's say, uh, topics or issues that, that we talked about over the last hour, there are ways to, to, sort of to, to deal with them. But I think the overarching thing is to really decommodify the housing market. It cannot be this kind of uh, prop for the economy that it has been. Um, 
real estate is said to be about 15% of GDP. This is really high for something that isn't really productive. Um, I mean, you once you build a, a building, it doesn't it doesn't do anything if you don't rent it out. If it's not um, if it's just for residential purposes, it doesn't really have it's not industry in in the in the nonsense. And this is why we have this big uh, trade deficit. Um, is that a lot of the the commodities we need on a daily basis we need to import, but housing yeah you can't import housing but you do import. Um, a lot of the, the raw material that goes into it. So it's also part of that. Um, so, so there must be a way to capitalize on all this housing that's been built and, and no one lives in. Um, and in a way that's fair to all parties concerned. So for the owners, for the potential tenants or, or other buyers or users, um, one of the ways uh, I think is key and I keep going back to is at least in urban areas, is that with rent reforms, there has to be massive rent reform, not of the old law that people are talking about and still want to sort of vacate the old apartment because they're, I think over the next five or six years, they're going to, to, to disappear organically. The, the, the contracts are mostly going to run out. But of the new so-called new law that was brought in, in 96, um, you really need to encourage um, a rental market uh, through um, better, more transparent uh, laws through awareness, um, through other sort of management uh, infrastructure of dispute re re resolutions of um, civil society being in this uh, sphere uh, to really put this uh, this housing to use. Otherwise, it's it's a very big waste. Um, in another way, we're looking at. Uh, climate change. Egypt has very big agendas and dreams for a green economy. Um, house building uh, by default is not very green uh, in terms of the energy and water it uses. And if we keep building surplus housing that we don't need, we're keeping using energy and water um, that are becoming more and more scarce. So I think there is a way, there is um, a win-win situation, but it has to be this holistic uh, strategy um, in a decommodified, depoliticized uh, housing market. Hmm. And then we can start planting our roof gardens too, because that's what Kyra needs as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I don't know if you have time for one more question or if our time is up. I'm good. Well, then I'll, I'll, I'll squeeze one, one last one in from somebody who just asked, um, how, how can the enormous informal fringe of the city be assimilated uh, into, into, in, 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 into the, 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 the housing market? I mean, again, in terms of possible solutions, what would you recommend for these you know, huge areas of the city that have been built this way and that have sort of mixed access to infrastructure and a mixed legal status? I mean, one of the things is to, to have the, a kind of a target. When you look at Cairo or any city, you see, um, I mean, one of it is, is very pragmatic. You, you can easily map out who uh, has infrastructure and who doesn't and, and, and see and plan for that. And again, we've seen how government spending on infrastructure has increased and ballooned um, over the last few years. And a lot of that money uh, could probably be better spent if it's targeted um, in that way. Um, and again, also going back to the, to the rent reforms, a lot of the housing that is self-built or so-called informal is actually empty. Uh, and again, speculative like these uh, tower blocks that, uh, that you saw some pictures of. So again, by putting them, um, I mean, rent would work either way. It would work across the market from uh, self-built, informal, formal luxury and, and so on. You, you've got this vacancy um, at all these levels. And then this would also start um, seeing uh, people be closer to um, existing services and so on. So some services are being built in places that will never be or will take a long time to be populated, whereas others are probably overcrowded. So 
you really need to see a plan. I mean, Cairo has, has for a long time not been planned. The last sort of master plan was, was in the 70s or 80s, and a lot of bits of it were, uh, were implemented. But since then, there hasn't been um, a vision of, uh, of how the city grows and, and many cities um, are growing. They've always stopped at a certain level of their uh, conception or they've had like the Cairo 2050 plan um, was, was very exclusive. Um, and uh, and was sort of shot down after the revolution. So um, so you really need to see uh, a lot of the social elements go back into uh, into planning. Yeah, I was going to say one one would hope that the plan would be both practical and take into account people's daily needs and also all mm -hmm. the all the thought and like care that actually a lot of people who study the city such as yourself and many others put into thinking about these issues. I used to attend uh, these uh, working groups that were hosted by an NGO in Cairo after the revolution and just there would just be a room full of people every week sort of talking together about how to make the city better. And I feel like there's this huge untapped potential of, of um, ideas um, and studies and and pro proposals and it would be really great to see those sort of like more incorporated and also to see you know the the value of the city is not an, of land and of housing is not being only commercial that it that it really you know be taken into account that this is this is something that belongs to everyone um Anyway, the there is so much more in the book than what we've managed to cover today. It is just a really dense and rich uh, read, and um, people can dip into it. I think in you know the chapters almost stand alone. Whatever particular issue you're interested in, um, you can you can you can go and and find a lot of information on. Um, so. Uh, I think you'll have a lot of interest in it, and I certainly it was it was it's part of my like small library of books about Cairo now. Um, and uh, I'm going to thank uh, AUC Press for hosting this talk, and I'm going to let you uh, say the last word. Yeah, yeah. I think it's uh, it's been great uh, being here. Um, I hope uh, all the participants managed to put in their questions and that I've answered uh, some of them um, properly. And yeah, I'm uh, really, really grateful to AC Press for hosting this and for you, Ursula, for uh, um, your moderation and your uh, knowledge of, uh, of Egypt. And uh, I guess have a good uh, rest of the evening, everyone. Yes. Yeah. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you Ursula for the wonderful moderation you've done and for Yahya for the knowledge and the book and for joining us tonight. And thank you everyone who's joined us. Uh, the video is gonna be available right after this on our uh, Facebook page, the American University in Cairo Press and in the future on uh, YouTube as well. And uh, if you still have questions, uh, you can send them to auc.press at aucegypt.edu and we'll try to maybe get Yahya to answer them for you by email. But um, again, thank you everyone and we wish you a lovely rest of the day or evening according to where you are. So that's it, thank you.